G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for another trade period video. Um, I guess basically wrapping up what was a very eventful week one of the trade period. Um, more, more so in the last couple of days. I feel like the rumors have gotten a little bit weird. It's been a couple of days since I've done a trade period uh, sort of wrap or an update. I've been back at work as well, so not listening to trade radio through throughout the whole day, but you know, following the boys group chat, just some of the rumors that are starting to pop up, in particular about you know Hawthorne and a potential fire sale, about the Adelaide Crows trying to go for pick one. It's uh, it's it's getting a little bit strange. I'm here to try and unpack a little bit of that for you. It's been a couple of deals that have gone down uh, in the last couple of days, which we'll touch on. And I want to talk a little bit about what Freeman are doing, particularly with a guy called Rory Lobb, because that is an interesting situation that I think is probably going to eventuate in a trade. Before we crack into the video, guys, I'm just going to do what I always do and invite you to subscribe or at least consider subscribing to the channel if you are enjoying all this trade period content. Still going to keep it up over the trade period and, you know, all the way up to the draft. We're going to try and almost go daily. I'll, I'll see what I can do. But if you are enjoying it, I would appreciate if you subscribe to the channel and like the videos. But anyway, let's crack into it. We'll ease into it with uh, one of the confirmed trades from today, if I'm not mistaken. It was Callum Coleman-Jones who moved from North Melbourne to the Richmond Footy Club. North Melbourne ended up handing over a future second round pick along with 40 this year and Robbie Tarrant, who was part of this deal in exchange for Coleman Jones, picks 42 and 47 and a future fourth round pick. So as I sort of touched on in previous videos, the reason why Richmond wanted Tarrant to be part of a trade when he was available as a free agent is because they wanted to protect their compensation pick uh, that they received from Mumbi Ochoa, which I think currently sits around 39 if that hasn't changed. Given that the free agency compo pick is kind of just looking at a free agency period as a sort of net result, if Tarrant had come in as a free agent when Chol had gone out, it probably would have dropped that 39 down to, you know, maybe 10 picks, I think they said. But anyway, Richmond have got their man. They've got an experienced key defender. They've got some backline injuries this year. Obviously, Broad and Bolter missed a big chunk of footy this year as well. And they're obviously going to roll the dice for another premiership. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And as such, an experienced player like Robbie Tarrant, who at times has been one of the best key defenders in the league, you could see him going to the Richmond system and playing really well. So I think that's a really, really good budget sort of trade from Richmond's perspective. The downside of this, of course, is that they lose a pretty talented young kid in Calman Jones. There's not that many, uh, you know, tall key forward talents that look like they can really be good AFL players going in the league. As such, they're valuable, but they've given him away at a pretty decent discount because, you know, he's out of contract, only played nine games. There was a bit of talk this would go to the preseason draft if they couldn't strike a deal, but in the end, Richmond has relented and given him up for a future second round pick, which to be fair, could be actually a pick in the early 20s anyway. A slight upgrade from 40 to 40 this year, as well as losing 47 and a future fourth. So all in all, the more I think about it, that's actually a pretty decent result for someone like Coleman Jones. And they also land their man in Robbie Tarrant. So I think both parties will be pretty happy with that result. Kind of does help North Melbourne's rebuild. Obviously looking at someone to partner Nick Larkey for the next few years. And Coleman Jones is obviously a little bit more established and ready-made than, say, drafting an 18-year-old in the draft. It's worth noting as well that the Ruse picks in the 40s are expected to shuffle up because apparently the only teams in between their picks are Collingwood and the Western Bulldogs. And when they match their bids for Dacos and Sam Darcy, those picks are going to evaporate. So North Melbourne basically get an extra free swing in the early 40s, most likely. The next topic I'm going to bring up is the alleged fire sale that's happening at Hawthorne. I don't know how realistic it actually is, but from the sounds of it, Hawthorne are trying aggressively to field offers at least for some established players that they've spent it fair chunk trading in. In fact, all of them. There's been a fair bit of conjecture along the likes of Tom Mitchell, Jago Romero, Chad Wingard, and Jack Gunston, all of whom were actually traded in from other clubs originally about whether they're going to end up playing at Hawthorne next year as Hawthorne aggressively try and move up the draft order. Now, this was previously just speculation, but then Jeff Kennett penned a letter to the members, I believe, sometime this week, suggesting that there were going to be some surprises in the upcoming trade period, but he urged the members to sort of trust the process a little bit, trust what Hawthorne are doing and that they've made careful consideration of their future. So really foreshadowing some aggressive trades there. Allegedly, Sam Mitchell's been on the phone to his mates at other clubs. He's played down those phone calls a little bit, but... The track record of Hawthorne obviously is to be a bit ruthless with some of their aging players. Sam Mitchell was obviously one of them as well. And just to clarify that point, they didn't necessarily shaft Mitchell and get him to go to West Coast. It sounded like a pretty respectful conversation, but obviously it was a little bit unprecedented at the time for a club veteran to get moved on when he's been such a champion of the club. The rumor is that Hawthorne have their eye on someone like a Finn Callahan in the draft this year who's expected to go probably about top five. And I think they feel that their threat to getting him is Adelaide. So they're trying to trade above Adelaide. 
The guys on the trade table, as I suggested, Mitchell, O'Meara, Wingard, and Gunston, the first three in that in particular were guys they aggressively traded to sort of navigate their mini rebuild, or at least the reset after their experienced premiership players moved on to other clubs. I think Jager O'Meara has been publicly linked to Port Adelaide as they're looking to shore up some depth. It'd be interesting to see how seriously he considers an offer like that from all the reports regarding O'Meara is that he wants to stay in Melbourne. He's not even from Melbourne, but I think he loves a lifestyle. I think he's got a partner there or something like that. So it would be difficult to see him uprooting and going to Port Adelaide unless there's a fair bit of money on the table, which I find hard to fathom. In any case, what does O'Meara really fetch on the open market? Probably under contract, you could probably ask for top 15. Obviously, under contract, you can really ask for anything. But Port Adelaide hold pick 18. They're not really in a position to give up much more than that. So not really a valued move for any party here, in my opinion. For what it's worth, Chad Wingard did sort of take to Instagram to put up a little Insta story. I think it was DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street. If you haven't seen the movie, it's from the scene where he says, I'm not fucking leaving. More or less suggesting that Wingard is not likely to be moving clubs at this stage. So we can probably rule him out. But the talk about someone like Tom Mitchell as well to a Richmond early this year, that chat hasn't really gone away, although it is hard to see it happening. So like I said, Mitchell actually came out and said that he had spoken to rival clubs, but not to any sort of level that's even worth talking to the players about it. In my opinion, that reads as he has shopped them around, but hasn't got any genuine interest. Apparently there's been no genuine offers for those players, and I'm not really surprised. Hawthorne, if they're going to do this risky strategy, really want to make it worth their while. So I don't think any of those players really fetch a really high draft pick. I don't think any teams who currently hold high draft picks will be willing to lose them for players like this. I think Hawthorne's going to be an interesting case study what someday we sort of talked about it a lot when they were sort of trying to reset after you know Jordan Lewis Sam Mitchell Luke Hodge all left the club they got in Wingard Mitchell O'Meara to sort of replace them in hindsight you'd have to say it wasn't the best strategy I'm sure Hawthorne fans will want to defend that but when you're obviously trading aggressively to get established players yes they did make the top four in 2018 but that was kind of an outlier from all the form we've seen either side of that Mitchell cost them pick 14 I believe O'Meara cost them pick 10 in a future second Wingard cost 15 15, 35, and Burton. To me, I don't know if they run the risk of kind of damaging their brand and their legacy a little bit by, you know, trading senior players as soon as they're not really of worth to them. And I guess you could argue logically that makes sense. It seems like a very American sports a way to approach it, but in the Australian landscape, it's kind of unprecedented. And I do wonder down the track whether that will make players think twice about moving to Hawthorne where as soon as they're, you know, 28 and the club's looking at a bit of a rebuild through the draft, suddenly they get a tap on the shoulder and they want to be moved on. Maybe that's just foreshadowing what this league is going to be like in five years. I can genuinely see that because we are seeing more and more a little bit since the Trelaw deal. There seems to be a little bit more of that going on. The next interesting story that came out of today was the Crows have made a mega offer to North Melbourne. It's not a massive surprise because Adelaide are obviously at the peak of their rebuild or the depths of their rebuild, however you want to describe it. They've got this once in a generation potentially talent from South Australia going likely pick one or two depending on where the day cost bid goes. There are a few picks off that and they obviously want to trade up to try and get this talent but I didn't expect it to happen in such a dramatic fashion and nor did I expect North Melbourne to dig in so relentlessly. According to Toomey I believe North Melbourne has knocked back an audacious bid from Adelaide to snare pick one in this draft after the Crows offered pick four this year their first round of next year and Melbourne's first round of next year so what we're talking about is pick four this year potentially pick four or five next year, depending on where Adelaide finish. And then an upgrade in the 20s based on current ladder positions would probably be like pick 23 to pick 20. It really shows what high regard North Melbourne and Adelaide hold Jason Horn Francis if that deal gets knocked back because pick four, five, and an upgrade in the late first, early second round is a very, very big offer. And I don't think I've ever seen an offer like that for an established player, let alone a kid who hasn't even debuted yet. There's obviously a lot of risk involved in the draft, and I know Horn Francis looks like an absolute beast, but if you get three players in the top 20, two of them in that top five, that could really set up North Melbourne for many years to come. Now, don't get me wrong. I see the appeal of Horn Francis. Look what Petrarca just did in the grand final. He's a similar sort of mature bodied 18 year old is explosive, can swing forward and kick goals. He can play against men already. He can break games open, but getting two top five talents in exchange for him is still a very good deal. We'll talk a little bit about Fremantle and Carlton. Obviously the Chera deal got finalized earlier this week for pick six and a future third. I've kind of talked about, you know, what it would cost these teams to get the trade done, but probably haven't really focused on the actual benefit that Carlton is extracting here. I think it's a really, really good acquisition for them. I think Fremantle trade very well. There were some people suggesting pick six wouldn't even be enough for someone like Chera out of contract. And I think that's a logical argument, but I always thought that pick six 
was absolutely the minimum, but I also thought that would generally get it done. So for Fremantle to negotiate an extra third rounder there, which helped them, you know, set up a later deal. I think they're pretty good at navigating through these players wanting to go home. I think they've extracted value. Again, it's not that Chera's are only worth pick six. I understand the argument why he's worth more, but at the end of the day, he's out of contract. He's nominated a club. For Fremantle to extract pretty good value out of that, I give them credit. And from Carlton's perspective, as far as I'm concerned, they've just recruited their number two midfielder. I think Chera's well and truly outperforming Cripps. Hopefully Cripps gets back to his best. But either way, that's a pretty good one-two punch with Walsh and Chera sitting behind him. I do suspect Fremantle's nowhere near done in this particular trade period. They did move 27 and that future third that they received in this Chera deal to get 22 for Clark then offer that to Geelong and allegedly Geelong have said we don't want 22 anymore we want your 19 that you just got from Gold Coast along with Will Brody. Now there's been a lot of criticism about Geelong's approach here where they have supposedly said they would take 22 and then as soon as Fremantle got picked 19 they were like oh no we want that. I don't know if I'm critical of that I actually think it's very logical if Geelong have been asking for a late teens pick this entire time Fremantle suddenly get one of course they're going to ask for 19 and not 22. I criticize them for asking for pick eight when they're not even playing this kid in their best 22 I think that was just disingenuous I think it ran the risk of damaging Geelong's reputation and their ability to get deals done in the future. 19 is consistent with the asking price that they originally asked for and there's nothing to suggest that Geelong had an in-principle agreement to accept 22 in the first place. As far as I'm concerned Geelong should only ask for pick 19 in return and if I was Fremantle I can understand why they're balking at that because at the end of the day Jordan Clark hasn't really proven much to be worth pick 19 so I still think the deal gets done I'm still leaning towards pick 19. If Fremantle only give up 22 for Clark after all that's been said, they've done very, very well again. Rory Lobb is another player that's uh, attracting a bit of attention. There's been so much mixed messaging about the deals to get Rory Lobb. From what I can tell, GWS are the most likely candidates to secure him. There was rumors they were going to try and flip in for Canelio. Then there was GWS going to part ways with pick two and get pick six back or something silly like that. Then Rendell on Trade Radio came out and said that Fremantle are desperate to get rid of Rory Lobb's salary and would be willing to accept a pick in the 50s. I don't think that's remotely true. It's hard to find clarity when there's so much swirling around the internet. And the funny thing about the internet is that things that are made up and things that are actually true can be indistinguishable sometimes. So I don't know what is realistically on offer for Rory Lobb. I think GWS clearly want him. They need a ruck forward solution. Fremantle, I don't think particularly value Lobb. He doesn't want to play in the ruck. He hasn't really performed for the salary he's getting. I don't know how keen they are to lose his salary because I don't think their salary cap situation is too tight. My opinion on what Roy Lobb should cost if he's contracted should probably be a top 20 pick. And I think GWS hold pick 15. Fremantle are cheeky though, um, and they have to be to navigate through the situation that they've been in over the last few years. Could they ask to upgrade pick six to pick four? Maybe that gets it done because I think GWS are linked to Mac Andrews, probably going to be there at six. It's an interesting one for me. I don't know if Cornelio is going to get shaken loose. I don't think he's the right sort of player for Fremantle for where they're at, but this one is one to watch because I've heard so much about this potential deal and I'm starting to not really understand how it's going to get done. Before we wrap up the video, I just want to point out that I think Fremantle must hold a record for players that have been traded to them and then back and vice versa. The ones that I can think of without putting even that much thought into it are Chris Tarrant started at Collingwood, went to Fremantle, went back to Collingwood. Trent Crowe started at Hawthorne, then Fremantle, then back to Hawthorne. Rory Lobb might join that club where he started at the Giants, went to Freo, could end up at the Giants now. Then there's a few examples of players who did it the opposite way. Lockie Neal has been thrown around. Is a trade rumor this offseason, could still end up at Fremantle. I still think he probably will in a year or two. Peter Bell and Adam McPhee both started at Fremantle, got traded to Essendon and North Melbourne respectively, and then back to Fremantle. I'm sure there's so many more examples out there and I'd love for you in the comments to point out some more because this is got this is weird. Anyway guys that will do for my trade update for today's video. We'll look to come up with something tomorrow. I don't even know what that's going to be yet but that's the fun. Hope you're still enjoying the videos guys. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new and I will see you in the next one. Cheers guys.